Right. BBC Basic. Your notebook contains a powerful basic interpreter. Really? Hmm. Well, there you go. This thing can do... A minute. Hello? Yeah. No, I was confused too. It's an Amstrad notebook. It's got BBC Basic in it. But that's not the topic of today's video. So now, let's get rid of this Amstrad thing, and then we'll do the actual video. So, see you later. Right, let's ditch the Amstrad and all the various set pieces. So today, we're looking at this thing. Ancient mobile phone was worth 3,000 quid. Let's take it to bits, see what's in it, maybe see if it works. I'll start also looking at why this cost 3,000 quid back in the 80s. So, if you watched one of my previous Spectrum videos, which is linked up here somewhere, you'll have seen me waving this phone around. Let's take it to bits and also see what mobile phones are like when this brick was... One moment. Hmm. Anyway, let's look at the history of this iconic piece of 80s tech and see if maybe I can get it working. Because currently, it's completely dead. Right, before we disassemble it, let's just take a nice look at this thing. You can see it's a bit worn, the cobwebs on it, and yes, this jug is probably wearing quite thin, so let's get rid of the thing. There we go. So, as you can see, it's had a bit of a tough life. I don't know what was going on down here. It's also bubbly, like something melted. I don't know if that was from its previous owner or in the eons that have passed since it was used and it's just been abused and stored somewhere but yeah this is the thing now what i want to point out is that this must have actually been used quite a lot like this has had not just a hard life being stored somewhere but if you look at the wear on these buttons like the the power button it's had all its text worn off it along with the end button which i think is what hangs up the coal this thing must have been actually used for someone's job. And they must have made thousands of calls on this thing. Because it takes a lot to wear these buttons out, you know. If we also look on it, scratched in here is the phone number of this phone. And if I take the battery off, which is clipped on pretty well. Let me get this thing off, there we go. There we are, big NICAD battery. Got some contacts down here. It's a bit of suspicious green battery crust on this thing. If you can see that. But it's a NICAD battery. Doesn't say what voltage or anything it is. Wait, it does say, oh, seven and a half volt. Now, this is the interesting bit. This sticker here that says approved for connection to telecommunication systems, blah, 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 with a little phone symbol comically made in USA. This is a sticker that all phones in the UK had to have on them. This was that they'd been approved by BT to be plugged into the phone system. But this is a cordless phone. It didn't have a base station. So it's very interesting it had that. And it's got this warning in here that tampering with or adjusting these four screws on the radio unit, which is what they called this thing, would void the warranty of the radio. And we're gonna go void this warranty. It's got four screws. These two here look okay. These two, they're not looking so good. I hope that when I open this, that it's not just some big rusted mess from this battery emptying itself inside. I'm hoping it's quite well sealed in here and that I can get it apart and it still looks okay. I've not opened this, so I have absolutely no idea what's in this. I've not opened it before making this video just to check it's even doable. So this next bit may be very short. If we're suddenly going on to some history about things and there's no more shots of the inside of this phone, that means I can't open it. 
but let's get some screwdrivers and work out how to get in. Right, let's try and get this apart. Let's see. Oh, the screws are undoing. This is promising. Will this one come out? It's really rusty. Yep. Right, so I've managed to crack the seal on the case. Let's get you a bit closer in so you can see. All right then, what will we discover inside the phone? Big load of stickers. I wonder how the aerial's connected. flat flex cable that connects the connectors at the back. We've got a little piece of coax that connects the antenna. Trying to see how that is even connected. Right, maybe I have to take this off. Did you see the little white sticker saying that tampering with the screws on this radio unit will void the radio warranty? Yes, this thing is more like a CB radio with clever electronics than a phone that we might recognise today. It's completely analogue. There's no 3G, there's no 4G, it doesn't even do GSM. So what did it do? Well, it's called 1G because, strangely enough, it was the first generation there are several systems known as TACs for Total Access Communication System and ETACs, which were created by a few companies that you might have heard of if you've owned a mobile phone for a while. One was Vodafone, another was Ericsson, and then there was Cellnet. And yes, these are all the same names that exist today. Now the network was all analogue, and it used frequencies between 935 and 949 MHz, and 890 and 904 MHz, for the handset, so they transmitted on one range of frequencies, received on a different. SIM cards didn't exist. The handsets had their identifying number actually programmed into them. So this wasn't a fashion phone that you upgraded every year just because the next model came out with different cameras and it was slightly thinner. I mean, the thickness of this thing compared to an iPhone, this is a brick, it's heavy. Phones today are so common, you're more likely to get funny looks if you don't have one. But that wasn't always the case. In the 80s, our phones looked like this. They also doubled as weapons. Nobody owned them, at best you rented them. My parents had one of these. It lived in the porch, where it was cold, so phone calls were pretty short. You see, mobile phones have been thought up, but they work more like CB radios. You had to follow radio rules to use them, and you had to have a license. Imagine having a license using a mobile phone today. There's this fantastic old Tomorrow's World episode you should go and watch, especially the bit where his phone call goes wrong and some random person cuts into the call because he's literally just transmitting across the CB radio waves. <laughs> I've actually got somebody. <laughs> Thank you for your help. This is a test on the radio network. I apologize for interrupting you. Over and out. <clears throat> Poor man. We'll try again. In the early 80s, mobile phones had one major problem. Batteries. They used so much power, the first ones were installed in cars. The handset went in the front with the driver, the giant box went in the boot, and then they stuck the antenna on the roof. I suspect this is where the UK phone store Carphone Warehouse originated, selling these monsters to install in your 1980s yuppie mobile. It wasn't until the late 80s that handsets like the one I have here, which is the Motorola 8500X, were available. So rather than send you to sleep with stock photos, let's look at mine. Well, I can't see any obvious damage to it. I mean, it's a bit crusty around there, but 
nothing else looks like it's bad. So I think we're trying to apply some power to it. Let's try and stick it back together. Right, so we know they're the power connectors. We know this is the battery. We don't know which way around the battery went. Right, despite not being charged up for a million years, we can sort of work out which one of these battery contacts is positive and negative. If I do it this way around, we show a massive minus 200 millivolts. Okay. If we do it the other way around, we show 20 millivolts. Oh, there we go. 200 millivolts. Okay. So this one is negative. This one is positive which means when this goes over like that, this one is negative. Okay, that's the negative connector. And it takes seven and a half volts. Well, we have a power supply. Let's see if we can power this up, see if it does anything, or whether it goes pop. Right, I've got my trusty Maplin power supply that I've had forever. Let's just turn down the current to, I have no idea what, but something low. Yeah, so, don't know if you can tell, but printed here quite obviously is a minus and a plus. So anyway, that one's negative. That one is positive. Turn it over. Turn it on. Well, it's not drawing any power yet, which is good. Ooh. Ooh, turn the current a bit. It's alive! Look at that! Let's do that again. Right, seven and a half volts. Let's turn it on. Says it's on. Says there's no service. It's drawing 0.5 of an amp, 0.7. Oh wow, that's the delete button. Nice. Wow. Well, there we go. This is probably spewing vast amounts of radio interference. Trying to communicate with a cell tower that hasn't existed for 30 years. But it works. That's pretty cool. Shame there's no service, but then again, my actual phone doesn't always have excellent service around here. So, you know, that doesn't mean much, does it? Right, well, I kind of want to take this to bits now, but without destroying it, because power's up, it's pretty cool. One thing I want to get across is just how insanely expensive owning a phone was back then. A similar model, the 8000X, was 3000 quid back in 1985, which is a thoroughly meaningless 
seven and a half thousand quid in today's money. But nobody today would spend seven and a half thousand quid on a phone. This comparison doesn't work. So let's go a bit more sort of relatable. You see, the average wage for the person who would have used this kind of phone, they would have earned 236 quid a week, or just over 12,000 pounds a year, which is about 30,000 quid in today's money. See, this doesn't match, does it? Things have gone up in price. Money is worth different. But there's no way your average worker would spend three months of their wages on a brick like this, especially when nobody else had one. If you had one of these, you were special. You were in that top 1% of 1%. This is an era where phone calls cost money. Talking to people was expensive. So you did it at a prearranged time and you made sure you had something to say. So this is an expensive yuppie status symbol. It's like a sports car or a private jet. If you actually owned one yourself, you were loaded. You had so much spare cash, you didn't know what to do with the stuff. If you had a company one, you must have been some high up executive that meant the company saw it was purposeful for you to have this and worth the money, along with your company car. Or you were some sales guy who lived out of his car selling washing machines or sewing machines or whatever, and you needed this as part of your job. Now, I wonder if I got the screws out of this thing. Right, I've managed to get these little screws out. These are the things that go in the corners. Weirdly, you tighten them to loosen them. So they've got a reverse thread. I guess that's so that when you're screwing in the case screws, it doesn't unscrew this. Aha, progress has been made. Taken out two nuts there, and it appears I can pry bits of it up. Which, as a kid, taking stuff apart, if I could pry something up and it didn't go crack, usually meant I was going in the right direction. Well, that's quite nice. Look at all of this stuff in here. There's a hand stuff. Let's put the goodies aside for a minute. Let's look at this. I can see chips, lots of chips. This is the handset part. It's got the buttons, little screen, and it's got a lot of US patents all over it. There's like a massive sticker. There's more US patents written on that sticker than in the about dialogue for Adobe Reader. What's underneath this? A lot of shielding as well. Ooh. All oh, goodies down there. We've got a, a 1986 dated, oh, it says on here, July the 23rd, 1988. Can you see that? It's down there. So this phone was made in 1988. But it's got a chip here. SC93408CFN. 60CO4. Made in 1986. There's a lot of shielding in this. They were mad keen on shielding back then. They were frightened that anything electronic that could radiate would mess everything up. Right, let's get onto the goodies. Can we get the goodies out of the packet? No, the goodies are soldered on. Right, if you know what any of this stuff is, or if you made these, let me know in the comments. Because what I can see is a lot of boards end on, soldered onto this main PCB, and then a lot of metal cans. Ooh, there's an EEPROM. Well, that's interesting. How can we get you, Aox? Uh, there's another chip, Motorola 1985. That one's got a Motorola logo. SC98012FN. 57 co one under this, there's another one. That thing there. 27C512. Yeah, there's an EEPROM 
want to get that out, I want to know what's inside it. How do we get this to bits without destroying it? A long middle board that's got a thousand million connectors on it. It's all soldered through hole. But the EEPROM is in a socket. But I can't get the socket out because random other boards are in the way. Maybe the random other boards are easier to desolder. Right, I'm going to have a think. We've realised these devices were expensive to own, but what about actually using them? Surely if you pay 3,000 quid for a phone, it's going to have cheap calls to make it more appealing, right? There's got to be something in this that makes it worth owning and not as expensive to really use, right? No. Completely no. Turns out that using them was just as expensive as owning them. So I dug up some statistics, and these are from 10 years later in 1994, but they should still be kind of surprising enough for us, given that I can FaceTime people in America for free. And if I do choose to make an actual phone call, I have so many free minutes with my phone that it's effectively free anyway. I'm just paying for access to the network. So maybe you're a Vodafone business customer. Okay, so you've got your 3,000 quid phone. Well, on top of that, you're paying 25 quid a month for line rental. And then it only costs you a mere 25p per minute. And I think on the early phones, you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but you also paid for incoming calls. I might be wrong with that. I'm sure someone will tell me otherwise. Now to put that in perspective, a payphone would quite happily let you chat away for a few minutes on a single 10p coin. You could get a lot of 10p coins for 3,000 quid and a recurring 25 quid a month fee. Right then, so I've desoldered this and then discovered that that was actually plugged in. Minus a few lot of things that I was supposed to desolder. But this board's quite nice. They've labelled all the different parts are. So there's a 45 megahertz thing. There's a reference oscillator. And there's our little chip that we're after. So I won't bother taking any more of these things off because when you get them off, they just look like this. And I can't open it without destroying it and I don't want to destroy it. It's all soldered together. There's no way of getting in that non-destructively. And I at least want this to go back together without there being any random bits left over. So let's try and extract our little EEPROM. It shouldn't be too difficult. Gently wiggle underneath. There we go. Still got all its legs, and they're all straight. So, as you can see, it's a 27C512. Copper at 89, and it's a UV EEPROM because I can feel the window through the sticker. So what I think we should do, stick this in an EEPROM reader, see if there's anything on it. You know how we like to poke fun at having to charge our smartphones every night, and manufacturers love to boast things about two-day battery lives? Well, these wonderful bricks took 10 hours to charge, and you got 30 minutes of talk time out of it. Half an hour of chatting for 10 hours of charging, and that was it. From a 1980s era NICAD battery. Remember NICADs? The battery technology where you had to fully discharge it before you could recharge it, otherwise it had that memory effect and it lost capacity. If you look at my phone, and I'm sure it's on the close-up you're looking at as well, I've got a set of gold contacts on the back that don't line up with anything in the battery pack. 
I bet you this has an optional car kit or power adapter. So you could keep it powered up all the time without running the battery down. Could you do anything beyond making expensive phone calls? Did it do anything else? You know, like the screen on it is tiny. Clearly you're not playing snake on this thing, but then it's not a Nokia, so you wouldn't anyway. But no, all it did was calls. That was it. And I want to get across just how important this was. You see, normal people use pay phones. Normal British people didn't even have pages for all you American people out there that did. Now, a payphone for the younger viewers, it's a special kind of cubicle on the corner of a street. Think of it like a public toilet, but someone's put a phone in it. Only the phone didn't do Facebook, and the toilet was one that you had to stand up in. What? All the payphones I ever used used to smell like toilets. Someone even had special cordless handsets, where like the handset disappeared. But I don't think they ever caught on, because people didn't bring the handsets back. You see, payphones back in the 80s and 90s were the most vandalised public thing out there. You really didn't use them unless you had to. You'd just wait till you got home for either of the things that people did in them. And what's a pager? Well, imagine a phone, but you can't talk through it. And it had a little screen, and all it did was tell you the number of the person who'd called you. You see, what you did was you get a page, then you'd run to the nearest public toilet phone, hope you had some money, and that you could call the number back before the person calling had either frozen to death, sat in their parents' front porch waiting, or got bored and they missed your call. Because also back then, if you missed a phone call, it was gone. You couldn't find out who had rung you up at this time. That came later. You see, making phone calls in the 80s from outside your house was awful. Having a magic box that you could carry around and just do it whenever you felt like it must have been amazing. To the point that merely owning one of these was enough. It didn't need to do anything else. You whipped one of these out your briefcase in a cafe, people would be looking at you like you were someone special. Right, so I've got the chip. Ignore the bad lighting. It's not lit properly in here at all for anything. So I've got the chip in my little EEPROM reader. We're going to load up the software. We're going to tell it it's a 27C512, one of those. Press read. No. Oh, tell it not to bother checking the ID. Don't know why that doesn't work. I'll read it. Do, do, do. And now we've got some data. Let's have a look what we got. So it says copyright Motorola 86. Um, level beep, alt off, off, auto full, bad type, battery low, something, yeah, there's a bunch of strings in this, level blah blah blah, oh, it's got like the menu inside it, all the text in the menu. There's a bunch of data, and then, oh no, then there's some more. That looks a bit suspicious, those strings, where have they gone? Right, so clearly, this is the EEPROM of the phone, that contains all its firmware and everything. I might dump this and save it, and put it somewhere on the internet. So let's save this. I save it to downloads, right. Let's call it, oops, can't spell, Motorola. 500x EEPROM is it really an EEPROM? UV prom or something? I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments file has been saved there we are so I'll provide a link to that if you want to dig through it and have a look see what's inside it but there we go that was quite fun right then so there we go so look inside a 1980s yuppie status symbol. Feel free to tell me about your stories of mobile phones in the comments. You know, when did you get one? Did you actually own one of these? Is what I've just said realistic or is that just junk I've made up from research off the internet? You see, I remember seeing some guy on the bus in the mid 90s on his phone, not one of these, one of the more modern ones, although it still had an aerial, 
And I remember thinking he was a complete show off. And then in 1997, they created Pay As You Go. And Nokia plopped out successive cheap iconic handsets and seemingly overnight, everybody had a phone. It just happened so fast that one day we didn't have them, then everyone did. I've not seen any technology take off like that since. And have you noticed how in science fiction stories, they always miss the invention of mobile phones becoming a thing? Like, I know in Star Trek and things they have communicators, but they were more like two-way CB radios. Or you might have some sort of pager, but no one seemed to predict the entire planet owning a portable device that could communicate with another portable device as completely normal as just talking to a person. And they don't make them like they used to either. If I drop this on the floor, it's going to bounce and I'll probably need a new floor. If I drop this on the floor, I've got to go and buy a new one. In fact, underneath the camera is one working as an auto cue with a smash screen, simply because it's good enough to use as that still. This is my second phone, because I dropped the first one, getting out my car, completely smashed the screen. This thing, as you've seen, so beaten up, but it's still in one piece. So there we go. Hope that was somewhat interesting. And until next time, see you later.